take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would please, to the Old Testament book of Haggai. Haggai. <clears throat> Maybe I should have announced that earlier. Um, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Get Malachi and then go left. You have Zechariah, and then right before Zechariah is Haggai. So it's the third of the last book of the Old Testament. Maybe that'll help you get there. <clears throat> Haggai chapter 2. <clears throat> Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read the first nine verses of Haggai chapter 2. And we read them responsively as we normally do. I'll read verse, we'll read together verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we'll alternate reading until we end together reading verse 9, Haggai chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and beginning together on verse 1 of Haggai chapter 2. Ready? In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful singing this evening. And Lord, it's been good to sing praises to you and it, it helps us and encourages us, and I pray that it's been a blessing to you. And Lord, we bow now as we come to open up your word, and we ask you to speak to our hearts this evening. Lord, we believe this is not the words of men or the words of a man. We believe these are the words of God. And Lord, we believe the Bible is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so, Lord, I pray that it would, each of us would listen and we would listen in faith that the word of God might be profitable to us this evening. So Lord, minister to us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be <clears throat> It was advertised that the devil was putting up for sale all of his tools on the day that the sale was, the tools were laid out, and they had prices marked on them for inspection. There were a lot of treacherous instruments there. There was hatred, envy, jealousy, deceit, pride, lying, on and on. But laid apart from all those tools was another tool, and it was priced very, very high, though it looked much more well-worn than any of the other tools. What's the name of this tool, asked one of the customers. That tool, said the devil, is the tool of discouragement. Well, why have you priced it so high? He said, because discouragement is more useful to me than all the others. With that tool... I can pry open and get inside a man's heart. And with 
and, and, and I can do that when I can't get near them with any other tools. And I use it on, I use it on almost everyone since so few people know that it belongs to me. Can I say tonight, discouragement is still the devil's tool. Not many people realize that he's using it on us, but he is. Life can be full of discouraging circumstances. Even the most blessed people, the most spiritual people, can face times of discouragement. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about how to stay focused when you get discouraged. How to get encouraged when you feel discouraged. What you read in Haggai tonight was a time when Israel has spent 70 years in exile in Babylon. They were carried away captive. We've been Sunday school, talked about Daniel, and then we talked about the three uh, Hebrew boys this morning. They were captive in Babylon there for 70 years. Finally, they're beginning to return home to Jerusalem. You have to remember that 70 years earlier, the city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed by Babylon. Basically leveled to the ground. They tore down the temple that King Solomon had built that you read about in Chronicles. That was leveled to the ground. The returning exiles, some of them came back with Nehemiah to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And then others, under the leadership of Ezra, came back to lay the foundation to build a new temple. But during that time, when they laid the foundation to build the new temple, the people got discouraged. And they spent 18 years and didn't do a thing. 18 years they looked at the beginning of that foundation of the temple and they simply stopped the work because they got discouraged. There's no progress, there's no rebuilding. And so God raised up a prophet named Haggai to challenge the people to get their priorities back in line with God's priorities. He preached in chapter 1 that we won't take time to look at this evening, but he preached to them about their priorities. And he said, how you spend your time and your money reflect your priorities. Your, your priorities aren't what you say they are, it's how you live. And he let them know their priorities were wrong, and that's why the blessings of God had stopped. See, when priorities are misplaced, the blessings stop, and when we get our life realigned again with God's priorities, the blessings will begin, to begin again and begin to flow into our life from God. Well, the people listened to Haggai and responded to his preaching and his admonition to put God where He rightfully belongs and to put Him first in their time and in their finances, and they obeyed, and they began to once again rebuild the temple. But I want to look at in chapter 2 this evening just how they became discouraged and what happens when they got discouraged. So we're going to look at the cause of their discouragement, and then I want to share with you the solution to their discouragement, and then we'll look simply at the results of what happened when they were no longer discouraged. Number one, look at the cause of their discouragement and look in the first three verses of Haggai chapter 2. They, they got discouraged. They were, uh, the word came to Haggai from the word of the Lord, and he spoke to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, who is the governor of Judah, Joshua, who is the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, this remnant, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Now to understand this, you remember in the book of Ezra, <clears throat> when they began to rebuild the temple, the Bible says when that foundation was laid that the young people shouted and the old people wept. Now, I think they, 
They could have wept for the beginning to see a temple being rebuilt. But you have to understand something. They probably were weeping because how small this temple would be in comparison to Solomon's temple. The, the temple that Solomon built was unbelievable in its grandeur, in its, in its uh, greatness, in its magnificence. <clears throat> it took years and years and years for them to construct the building. And, and I think as they looked at what was being built now in comparison to what they remember, the old folks wept. It's, it's, it's similar to maybe what sometimes older Christians think of when some young people get excited about something that's happening today, but some, some older folks remember the revivals from another year, from another generation. And, and we think, well, they're getting excited about this. They don't understand what real revival really is all about. And so the old people weep while the young people are all excited. I understand that. And maybe that's some of that was going on. But I think they were a little bit discouraged because they felt like what we're doing here is pretty insignificant compared to what they did back then. In other words, we can become discouraged when we feel like what we're doing for God right now doesn't really amount to very much. I mean, when you think about, if you, if you stop and think, okay, you know, what are we actually doing to impact a world of 7 billion people? If you, if you think on that and dwell on that, you think, man, I don't know that we're getting much done. And sometimes when you start to thinking that, well, what I do, it doesn't matter. Sometimes people think, well, if I'm there at church, it, may, it won't even matter if I'm not there. Well, if I don't show up, I know I, I said I'd be there, but if I don't show up, no one, no one will miss me. See, we get discouraged when we think that what we're doing for God doesn't really matter. That's where they got. And they began to get discouraged because they felt like nothing really mattered. Sometimes... We, get hard, we work hard to get our priorities in line with God's priorities, and it seems like our efforts are futile. It's pointless. It's like a husband who works hard to get his family priorities and his marriage priorities back in line with what God's Word says. So he stops working so many long hours. He cuts back on that, leaves his, leaves his work at the office, doesn't bring it home, starts giving his wife undivided attention, starts spending time with his children. He maybe establishes a, a one night a week to date his wife and go out and spend time just with her, making his marriage a priority, which is what every husband should do. There's a good place for an amen right there. But instead of his wife getting excited about her husband's new priorities, she complains that he's smothering her. That she's so used to having her own life and him not being around, and her kind of having her own schedule and doing her own things, she's not so sure she wants it to change. So the husband gets discouraged and feels like, well, all the effort I made doesn't mean anything. It didn't work. All this was for nothing. And he gets discouraged. Our mom or father, uh, parents who get convicted about passing on the Christian values to their children. You know, it's not the job of the church to pass on values to your children. It's the job of the parents to pass on the values to your children. The church can reinforce what you're teaching and what you're impressing on them. But the truth is, uh, Deuteronomy tells us that the children are to learn those principles of loving the Lord with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength from mom and dad. And then they'll get that reinforced when they come to church. So they make a commitment to be more active in instructing their children in the faith and help them to grow spiritually. Maybe one of the children has a problem with lying. And so they focus on biblical values and especially 
certain Bible verses about being honest. But instead of the son getting better, he just gets worse and ends up lying more than he ever has before. And they get discouraged and feel like their efforts are just pointless. Sometimes people struggle with their promise to faith promise missions. They, they, they say, man, we're going to try and do more for missions and more for reaching the world with the gospel. I want to participate in what God's doing. You hear someone like Brother Stevens on a Wednesday night and you say, man, I, I want to have a part with a ministry like that. And so they start looking at what they contribute and what can we do and they try to cut back where they can, but then they think, well, what we're given is so small, what difference could it make? Whether we give this amount each week or each month, what difference will that make? No one even notices if it's not there. And we get to thinking it just doesn't matter. Maybe you know a little bit what it's like to rearrange your priorities or make some changes and you're expecting to get a certain result and it doesn't happen. And it's easy for discouragement to come. And that's where they were. And that's what all of us can go through when we don't see the results that we expect. But not only that, we don't just see what we expect. It gets worse. And then throw up our hands. Sometimes people come to church and they'll, they come to church because things are bad. A lot of times people take the church as their magic genie lamp. You know, I had a rough week. I better go to church this Sunday. Rub the lamp and hope it gets better. But they come and they'll hear the gospel and maybe even they make a profession of faith in Christ and then they find out things get worse. Hmm? Now what am I supposed to do? I mean, don't, don't we say God has a wonderful plan for your life? Huh? Tell that to, to the, uh, Diane Stiltner who when she got saved and then her husband got saved and they both got baptized within... Within four months, he'd had a heart attack, become diabetic, and they lost their business. They, they were over-the-road truckers, lost their truck, lost their business, lost their house, lost everything. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Huh? And yet, th- by the way, to, 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 to the glory of God and to her credit, they just stayed faithful. Amen. Through all that, Diane Stiltner, I don't know that they ever missed a service. Just, just tremendous testimony. But you understand how that could be discouraging? That's why sometimes I meet people and I, well, well, not sure if they die, they go to heaven and you go through the plan of salvation with them and you get down to them receiving Christ, Brother Danny, and they say, oh, I tried that. You tried it? You know, I want to say, what, what in the world does that mean? What they mean is, I tried that and I thought things would get better. It didn't, so I'm not doing that anymore. You see, they got discouraged because it didn't, work out the way they thought it would work out. You ever been there? Discouragement. Nothing you seem to do matters or makes any difference. It just seems to get worse. Well, in verses 4 and 5, we have the solution to their discouragement. Notice what the Bible says here. Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith Haggai. No, saith who, church? the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, O ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. So here's the solution to that kind of discouragement is we have to focus on what God says is important and we have to remember His promises. We, we, we get discouraged when we forget the promises of God. The people of Israel need to be reminded of God's promises. He commanded them to be strong. He commanded them to work and keep building. To don't cave into fear, but he reminds them of the promise of God. Notice verse 5. I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. Notice the end of verse 4. After he said, work, I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
God says, I am with you about 18 times in the Bible. And every time God says He's with somebody, it comes at a very critical moment in their life. I'm sure those three Hebrew children were sure glad that Jesus was with them when they went in the fiery furnace. And, and He's there. Brother Yoder talked to me after Sunday school and he said, now how many men were in the fire? And I said, four. He said, how many men came out of the fire? I said, three. He goes, you know why? I said, no. He said, that fourth one's still in the fire waiting for you. Because we'll all go through the fire. And when we go through the fire, he's waiting there to go through it with us. Amen? That was good. And so every time you reach a critical point, you have to remind yourself, Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Somebody says, well, I'm just lonely, I'm discouraged, I just go home and it's just me. Uh, did Jesus not go home with you? If you need to, when you make dinner and you sit down and put your plate out, why don't you put a plate on the other side of the table and put a table setting there and say, I'm having dinner with Jesus tonight. And, and have a conversation with the Lord while you have your dinner. You're not alone. I am with you. You, the Lord says. He's, it's more than just being present, but everywhere as God is omnipresent, but it means He is with us. Emmanuel is God with us. Not just around us, not just in our presence, but He's with us. Okay, And, and He's always near to us. <clears throat> he reminded them in verse 5 of the covenant relationship that He made when they came out of Egypt. You know He entered that covenant relationship with Abraham and then with Isaac and with Jacob and, and went on down the line. He said, I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to be your provider. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And He made that covenant with Israel that He'd be their defender and their garden guardian. And so even though they got discouraged, God reminded them, I've got a covenant with you. And I am with you. And I am here to take care of you. And then he reminds them of something else. Notice, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. Now there's not always a lot said in the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit because at that time, the Holy Spirit came upon people and empowered them for certain tasks, but then He left people. That He does not work that way in the New Testament age, in the day in which we live. Once Jesus has ascended to heaven, the Spirit of God indwells the believer. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your body. Your body, the Scripture teaches, becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Alright, so now He dwells in every believer. Romans 8 verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God living in you. And, and He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He is, he is God's seal. He's God's seal on you and me that His promise is He's going to get us safe to heaven. That's the seal of the Holy Spirit that the Bible speaks of. So we have the Spirit of God that dwells in us. And we do well to remember <clears throat> in times of discouragement, God the Holy Spirit lives in me. He is called the Comforter. Okay, He's the Comforter. And, and so there's times we must need comforted. Okay, And usually when we're afraid or when we're discouraged, we need somebody who's called alongside to help. That's the, the, the word for the Holy Spirit. He's one who's called alongside to help us. You don't do this on your own. If you try to live a Christian life in your strength and in your power and with your ability, you will be discouraged. And you will eventually quit. Call it burnout. Call it tried that, done that. You know, I don't care. You, know, you do whatever you want to call it, but you'll get discouraged and drop off because you're doing it in your power and not within the power that God's given you. So you have the Holy Spirit. And remind yourself that we have the Holy Spirit of God. The promise, then he reminds them to don't forget the promises of God. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. 
Uh, the thing people worrying about what will I eat, what will I drink, what will I wear, what kind of clothing, what kind of house, what, what, all these basic needs that God says, I know what you have need of. You know, it would be just as silly as, you know, uh, Bob Reed going home tonight and Isaac uh, seems distraught and worried. He said, Isaac, what are you worried about? Well, Dad, I'm just not sure I have anything to wear tomorrow and I'm not sure that uh, you paid the you know, electric bill that we have heat tonight and I'm not sure that you, you know, paid the rent so we can stay here another night and Dad, I'm just worried about all these things. You know what Bob would say? Bob would say, son, you don't worry about any of those things. I take care of all of that. I'm the dad. You will always have a place to live. You'll always have a roof over your head. I will always take care of you. You'll have clothes to put on. You'll have food to get in your stomach. I'm your dad. I'll take care of you. Don't you worry about a thing. Now, as silly as that would be for an 11-year-old boy, it's Isaac 11, to be concerned about that, how silly do you think it is when we fret about those things to God? And God looks down and says, don't you think I know you have any of those things? Don't you think I'll take care of you? Hmm? Do, you do we trust God's promises? See, don't, don't, don't get caught up in, well, I know the Bible says but. No, get that but out of there. And just say, I know the Bible says this. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to take Him at His promise. No matter how scary it may seem, no matter how fearful it might be, that's why he said, you remember my covenant and my spirit's with you, so fear ye not. And don't be afraid. Sometimes we, we revert back to the old way just because that's what we know. And that's comfortable. Somebody says, well, to step out by faith and, and, and do this and live this way and, and step out by faith and change my life. Man, I don't know about that. That's kind of scary. That's why you have a comforter. That's why you have a Holy Spirit. That's why you trust God for that. And, and allow Him, take Him at His word, trust His promises. God has never one time broken a promise. I don't care who you are in this room, there's, there's all of us are, are if, you pinch, if I pinch you, you're going to say, ouch. All of us have flesh. And there's not anybody in this room, no matter how well-intentioned we are, that hasn't at some time or another broken a promise not kept a word that we wanted to keep, we intended to keep, but maybe because of some things that come up, we just couldn't do it. And we had to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. I said I would do this, or I said I could do it, and I can't. And we had to break that promise. That has never happened with God. That has never happened with God. That has never happened with God. Okay? Yeah, you better say amen. You don't want to be here all night, do you? And... And that's true. God keeps His promises. You know, it's funny. We can, a few weeks ago, I had to take my car into the shop. It wasn't, you know, when I would stop, it didn't want to keep idling. It wanted to quit, and I'd have to start it and, and kind of put it in neutral and keep the gas on and keep it running. And I said, well, I better get this checked out. And I take it down to the guy, and, you know, he comes out, and, well got to have this, you got to have this, you need this, and uh, what about your tie rods? When's the last time you had those? I said, oh, he, says, oh, he said, I'll tell you what, preacher. He said, I don't know how those things haven't broken off. He says, they're bad. So, you know, uh, what? you're like me. All I want to know is, give me the bottom line, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was expensive. Uh, but you know what? He's a mechanic. Took his word for it. Got to be done, got to be done. You got to have a car that's dependable and safe and uh, take trips in and travel in. Uh, it has to be done. So I took his word for it and got the car repaired. You, you're sick, you go to the doctor, he says, okay, here's a prescription. You, where do you get your prescriptions filled at? And you tell him where you get your prescriptions. And he says, okay, we'll send it there. And, uh, or you go there, here it is, you take it in or whatever it is. And you, you go take it, and you take those pills, and it says twice a day or two times a day, take two pills. You do it, don't you? Why, why do I take the mechanic's word, and I take the doctor's word, and I won't take God at his word? Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Shouldn't I believe his promises? Shouldn't I trust him and what he says? 
The cause of the discouragement is sometimes when we think what we're doing is insignificant or it doesn't matter, it's not making any difference. And the solution is trust the promises of God. Just, just take out of this word. Rely on the Holy Spirit who He's given to us to help us and claim His promises. But then let's look at the results of what happened. Look at verse number 6. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, and the, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. You understand what's going to take place here is a prediction, a prophecy, if you will, about the future. God says, and I remember this is, this is hundreds of years yet before the coming of Christ, but the Lord says, I'm going to shake some things up. I'm going to shake the heavens, I'm going to shake the earth, and I'm going to shake the sea, and I'm going to shake the dry land. They, uh, I think that just as God at different times in the Scripture, cause the earth to quake. He certainly can do that. And God's going to shake things up again. When he, You notice verse 7, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. Tell me, Answer me this, who's the desire of all nations? Jesus Christ is. That's a prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know what all the nations of the world are really yearning for? Jesus Christ. Peace. They want peace. Well, who's peace? Jesus Christ is. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. He didn't say peace on earth, goodwill toward men. He said on earth, comma, peace. Because peace had come to earth. Not, not something, someone. Jesus Christ. And He's the desire of all the nations. Oh, they don't know they're yearning for that, but that's the void that's in the heart of every human being that only Jesus can fulfill. Nothing else will fill that. Nothing else will satisfy that. And then he makes an amazing promise in verse 9 when he says the second temple of Haggai's generation will eclipse the glory of Solomon's first temple. I mean, that's pretty incredible. You say, well, how can that be? Well, you remember, this temple that they're building now will be the temple that Jesus Christ will go into when He comes to earth. He'll occupy this temple. He, Solomon's temple could never say that. They never had the Son of God come into that temple. It couldn't make that claim. And God said, it's in that place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's interesting. Of course, the word peace is the word shalom. And understand shalom in the Old Testament is, is a very equivalent to the New Testament word for salvation. Because shalom is more than just an ending of hostility. Shalom means a restoration to completeness and wholeness. It's forgiveness of sin, but it's also healing of brokenness and reconciliation with people. Now again, Haggai is saying this about 500 years before Jesus is ever born of the Virgin Mary and walks on this earth. I was reading a book that was giving an illustration from a, a book, I'm trying to think of the fellow's name. He wrote, um, he was an atheist, I believe, or didn't believe in God, and he began to read and was going to disprove the fact that Jesus was really God, and in that process, he ended up getting saved. Lee Strobel, that's his name, yeah. And in that, uh, in one of his books that he wrote was an illustration about if, if all these prophecies that were given in the Old Testament, <clears throat> if, just, if just one of them had come true of the many prophecies that were given, he said the odds of that happening, the odds of somebody predicting something 500, 700 years out, that it would happen exactly as the Old Testament prophesied it would. 
He said, would be like you taking silver dollars and scattering them over the entire state of Texas. I forget how many deep. It was four or eight deep. Over the entire state of Texas. Then, blindfold a guy, mark one of those silver dollars, mark one of them, and I can't remember how he marked it, but he said it was marked so it would be different from all the others. Blindfold a guy and tell him to find that one silver dollar on the first try. I forget what it was. You know, it was something to the 27,000th power. You know, it was so many zeros you can't even think of the, say the number that that could ever happen. And yet, at not just one prophecy, every single prophecy that was spoken of Jesus Christ has come true. He fulfilled every one of them. And here, he's going to come into the temple. That, when they threw the palm branches down in the street and, and cried Hosanna in the highest, that's the temple that Jesus would appear in. Even though that temple, he said, looks small now. <clears throat> it's nothing like what you think Solomon's look like, but God has big plans for this temple. God has things in mind for this temple a little glimpse of what to come, what's to come yet. Now listen. Sometimes we look at what we're doing and think it really doesn't matter much. That it's pretty insignificant. But I think we do good to remember, as Haggai reminded them, that we may only be getting a glimpse of what God may do in a much greater way in future generations. I don't know what the people had in mind in 1955 when they started Bible Baptist Church in that little school over on Frank Road. In 1957 when they bought this piece of land and erected that building downstairs and met down there for several years. And then in 1970 when they built this auditorium, this building. I don't know if one day they... Do you think they had any idea when they did that that one day this church would have 71 missionaries? That this church would have men that are traveling to India and Uganda? That are training 30 and 40 and 50 pastors in other countries for the work of the ministry? You think they, they ever dreamed that, some of the, that, that there'd be a, 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 a country fair day? A, 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 what do we call it this year? I can't remember. I always call it country fair. What is it? Yeah, the fun fest. Or a turkey dinner Sunday where we feed anybody who wants to come a turkey dinner. No, I, I don't know that they ever had any idea that something like that would take place. You see, we may not have any idea what God still has yet to do in the future after work on of what God could do. Consider the missionary David Brainerd. In, 1700s, in the 1700s, David Brainerd felt the call to bring the message of Christ to the Native Americans. Brainerd faced constant discouragement as he tried to share the gospel with the Native Americans. They had seen much too much of American greed and abuse to believe Brainerd's message of grace. Brainerd wrote in his journal, My heart sunk. It seemed to me that I'll never have any success among the Indians. My soul is weary of life. I long for death. For two years, nothing happened. He constantly battled discouragement. Finally, three and a half years into his work, he saw about 150 Native Americans come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now that's, that's not a great number in three years, or three and a half years, but it was a start. But what was unexpected was, a year later at the age of 29, David Brainerd died. And his work seemed to stop completely. 
But you see, that's not the end of the story. David Brainerd's journals were published. Those journals he kept through those times of discouragement. Those journals fell into the hands of a young guy named William Carey. William Carey is known as the father of modern missions. He ignited the missionary movement that continues to this day. Carey's efforts has resulted in literally millions and millions of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. When someone asked William Carey what inspired him to devote his life to missions, he pointed to the journals of David Brainerd. God used David Brainerd far beyond what he ever thought he would. It was about 1882 at Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia, and they had to turn away a little girl from Sunday school because it was just too crowded. Hattie Mae Wyatt went home that day and started saving her pennies to help the church make more room for their children's ministry. Two years later, though, Hattie Mae tragically died of diphtheria. She was only seven years old. In her little pocketbook next to her bed, her parents found 57 pennies and a piece of paper with a note saying the money was to help the church build a bigger children's ministry. At Hattie Mae's funeral, her mother gave that 57 cents in the note to Pastor Russell Conwell, pastor of the Grace Baptist Church, Philadelphia. That Sunday, Pastor Conwell shared Hattie Mae's story with his congregation. People's hearts were touched. A realtor gave the church a piece of property to expand the children's ministry and ask for 57 cents as a down payment. A local newspaper carried the story and soon news about Hattie Mae Wyatt's 57 cents spread across the country. Those pennies grew far beyond those initial 57 cents. Grace Baptist Church not only built a new children's ministry, but they also built a new church that seated over 3,000 people. Not only did they build the church, they also built a university called Temple University and Good Samaritan Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm told when you visit Temple University, you can find a picture on the wall of Hattie Mae Wyatt, a little girl whose 57 pennies were used by God far beyond the limits of her life. You see, God likes to use people beyond our limits so He'll get all the glory. Say, what can, what can 57 cents do? Look what, look what it did when it placed in the hands of God. What can, what can five loaves and two fish do? What can it do when placed in the hand of God? What can two mites do, says the widow? What can they do when placed in the hand of God? He likes taking a temple that seems pathetic in comparison to the first temple and visiting that second temple with his son, Jesus Christ. He'll take a faithful servant like David Brainerd who felt like he had failed in his life to inspire others like William Carey to reach the world with the gospel. He'll take a little Hattie Mae Wyatt and inspire many others to reach a new level of generosity and giving to the work of God. You see, if you stay focused on the promises of God in times of discouragement and you work and you, you rely on His Spirit and you remember His promises, God will use you far beyond your expectations far beyond our limitations everybody faces discouragement don't i don't know i don't care who you are there's times you get discouraged 
and we have to remind one another that when it comes to times of discouragement, that God can use us beyond our limitations. That God, whatever God's given us to use, is significant. That boy probably thought my lunch is anything, but we still talk about it. He had no idea that it'd make it into the Bible. And people would be talking about it for thousands of years. He had no idea. That widow putting those two mites in when everybody else was giving their abundance, I'm sure she didn't think anything about it, and I think no one else did either except Jesus noticed it and pointed it out. And we still talk about the widow who gave two mites as being the greatest giver of all time because Jesus said she was, because she gave everything she had. God uses whatever we give to Him. Don't judge it by what you see now. You don't know what God will do long after we're in heaven. Put the effort into rearing your children, to teaching them the values and the scriptural principles that is your responsibility, mom and dad. Well, I don't see it's doing any good. You just keep teaching it. You just keep, keep, not just teaching it, modeling it for them. Even if it doesn't seem to make a visible difference. God's promises are true. Trust them. You can count on God to keep every single promise He's ever made. And then believe that God will use you beyond your limitations because He can. And He will. And He does. Let's pray. Shall we, Father, take our truth now this evening. Lord, I pray that if some tonight are in the midst of discouragement, that they'll remember the promises of God to them. that you are with us, never alone, no, never alone. You promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Thank you for the many promises you give us. And Lord, help us always not to focus on the problem, but on the promise. And trust you, for you've never failed us yet. And then, Lord, may we look forward to see what you will do if we just give everything to you. Use us exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. That these people we talk about, the David Brainerds, the William Careys, the, the Hattie Mae Wyatts who only had seven years on this earth. And yet, Lord, here we are, 170-some years later, huh, talking about her. And her contribution of 57 cents. Lord, remind us that little is much when God is in it. And I pray we'd have numbers of people in this room tonight who would say, God, use me beyond my limitations. In times of discouragement, I'll realize that I'm going to keep working and keep trusting your promises. Keep doing what I know you say is right to do. And know that you can do greater things than I could ever ask or think. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for desiring and, and being able to work in us and through us. Encourage people tonight, Lord, with your word. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying here in just a moment. I wonder how many people tonight would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. Sometimes maybe you get the feeling that what you're doing is pretty insignificant. What's it matter? Oh, it matters. Maybe 
you tend to get your focus off what the priorities really are. Maybe even trying to make some changes and you're not seeing the results you think you should. Stay at it, my friend. Stay with it. Trust God's promises. He won't fail you. Trust His Spirit. Ask for His help. He's there to help you. He's there to encourage you. And I wonder if you tonight you say, and I pray that God will use me beyond my limitations. That God could do something exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask or think. So He would receive all the glory. I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat this evening. And he spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Oh, that's good. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. Why don't you bow the knee and ask the Lord to help you? To keep your focus on him and his promises. And that he might use you beyond your limitations. And do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. With your little. Because little is much when God is in it. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Have your way now in each one of our lives during this invitation time. Lord, we, it's hard to express how grateful we are for what a great God you are to us. That you would choose to Use vessels of clay as such as us. And I pray, God, that you'd hear our prayer that we make on bended knee around these altars this evening in these chairs. And Lord, use this congregation at Bible Baptist Church, this gathering of people here, to do great and mighty things that we know not. We'll give you the praise and the glory for all you'll do.